Welcome back. This is the second video of a series of short clips created to help caregivers and educators to understand a little bit better the basics of sensory processing and its implications. This presentation is possible thanks to TAP and Illinois Extension. This time we will do a quick review from last presentation and then we will go over what defines a sensory processing disorder. So as we mentioned previously, Sensory processing refers to every mechanism that is gonna help us to make sense of the world through our eight senses. Our brain gets this information and it's gonna interpret them as sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. In addition, we have our vestibular system that is gonna help us primarily with our balance. We have our proprioceptive system that is gonna help us with our body position on space, and also our interoceptive system that is gonna help us with our internal organs. So what is a sensory processing disorder? It's been described as a brain traffic jam. It's when sensory inputs are either not detected or your brain is having a hard time organizing them to make an interpretation to generate an effective response. What this means is that someone can either need more or less stimulation than the average to feel comfortable and to make sense of the information. A sensory processing disorder is any sensory difficulty that can lead you to having a hard time in everyday tasks. If we don't pay attention to these difficulties, or if we as parents or educators don't validate these necessities, a person with SPD can have behavioral problems, uh, can have anxiety and even depression. So what does it look like? SPD is a broad spectrum with levels of severity and it can go in different directions. As you can see in the image, a person can be situated in this continuous of responsiveness and under responsiveness over one sensory system or in more than one sensory system in another scale of sensitivity. Some cases are very easy to identify. For example, when a child gets irritated by loud noises, this can be uh, explained by an over response from the hearing system to a sound that in the average wouldn't be disruptive. Uh, but in other cases, it's not so clear and it can be disguised as a disruptive behavior. For example, when a child is under responsive to the proprioceptive system, that child can be constantly seeking for more information of that kind and he's gonna be labeled uh, like the risk, as the risk taker, as the troublemaker, because he's gonna enjoy pushing and pulling, right? And he's gonna have a hard time staying still in the classroom, etc. People who are hypersensitive process the stimulation as too much information with their brains getting overload. This means that they may see, feel, or smell in a more extreme manner than other people. For example, they may need to avoid eye contact in order to be able to pay attention to what you're saying because this information creates this traffic jam between what they're hearing and the rest of the sensory stimulation. Another common, um, another common over response in children with the spectrum is food sensitivities, oftentimes labeled as the picky eaters. Um, one possible explanation to this uh, phenomenon of getting attached to a very small list of food options uh, can be an uh, over response to textures and flavors. People who are hyposensitive are under responsive to sensory information received. In this case, what happens is that the brain struggle to process with such little information. Hyposensitivity can also be misunderstood. For example, when a child is under responsive to the hearing system, he may look like uh, he's not paying attention or that he's often distracted. Um, in other cases, when we're in the presence of tactile hyposensitivity, that child will need more stimulation of that kind and he's gonna enjoy a deep touch or he's going to enjoy getting messier than the rest of the friends when they are finger painting. Understanding and addressing SPD is important and we can do it in three different levels. Usually when the approach involves these three at the same time is when we see better results having a child that is going to be more comfortable with the sensory information received and also with his own sensory needs. When the treatment is person-centered there's usually sensory-based intervention in a sensory gym or it can also be a cognitive approach where the children is engaged in activities that, that will reinforce the sensory information we want to work on like taking them to soccer class, gymnastic, uh, cooking classes, 
etc., depending on what you want to stimulate. When the focus is the caregiver, there will be a parent coaching and participation during weekly sessions where the caregiver will learn to incorporate this knowledge in everyday activities. Um, he will also be able to explain uh, his children's necessities to others. And most importantly, the parents will learn to read more efficiently their children's needs. When the intervention is around the person supporting and adapting the environment, you will find visual aids used at home or also in school settings. Uh, there could also be related to seating considerations during class or adapting an activity that is going to support his sensory needs. For example, giving them something to touch or something to chew on while, while they're reading or giving them a bouncy chair. In our next presentation, we will go through every sensory system and we will explain how they may influence behavior. Increasing your understanding in this relationship will help you to support your children or student with those needs.